pull up resources of things we talked about during the workshop. Um, so you don't have to worry about screen chatting or furiously taking notes today. Uh, it'll all be on our website, um, along with a lot of other cool resources. So hopefully you check that all out. So today's workshop is container gardening. And um, I'm really excited to do the workshop because I think when people hear the word container gardens, they might immediately think it's kind of limiting or restrictive in some way just because of that word container. It's contained. It's got to be like small and cramped and things can't grow. But what I'm hoping that you'll get out of the workshop is that container gardening is not so much a restriction. It actually is extremely adaptable, accessible, flexible, and really manageable. Um, so it's kind of a method that can allow you to garden anywhere, anytime. Um, so that's going to be the aim of the workshop today. Uh, in the next slide, you'll see a list of topics that we're going to go over today. Um, so first, we're just going to go over some basics of what is container planting. Next, we're going to go through the benefits of container planting and some of the challenges. And then throughout the workshop, we'll work through the challenges for how you can overcome them. We're going to go over what are the different types of containers that you can use um, and what might, you, might, what might work best for you based on what you're able to put into the container, how much time you can put into it, um, what kinds of things you're growing in there. So we'll go over all different types. Uh, there's also what all containers need. So those are going to be universal principles of container gardening, basically drainage and good potting soil um, and good watering techniques as well. After that, I'm going to go through some basics of how to plant, water, transplant, and repot, and to know when you need to do all those different things. And then we're just going to have some like photos and examples from around New York City of indoor container planting and outdoor container planting, which can hopefully just start to get some of your creative juices flowing for your own space. All right, so container gardening. The definition is growing plants exclusively in containers instead of planting them straight into the ground. And um, so container planting, that's a pretty broad definition. So uh, even raised beds are technically container planting as well. Although I won't be going over container, I won't be going over raised bed stuff as much today. There'll be mostly other types of containers. Um, and there are really, con container planting is kind of the standard for New York City gardening. Um, just because one, there's not a ton of available farmland uh, or fertile plots of land in New York City that people have access to. And uh, also a lot of people don't plant straight in the ground in, in New York City or in urban areas because the soil can contain contaminants and things like that. <clears throat> so when we're talking about containers, they can be anything. It can be pots, raised beds, burlap sacks, upcycled materials that you've dug out of your recycle bin, um, five gallon buckets, hanging baskets, storage tubs, like the kind you buy from stores and stuff or have under your bed, uh, and even shoes and sneakers. We have a school gardener who encourages her students to plant in their old sneakers and repurpose them that way. You can see in the picture, these are uh, like cans that people have decorated and grown out of. Um, and in the beginning, you were all throwing out some pretty good ideas, too, of unconventional containers to grow out of. So in the next slide, we have the benefits of container gardening. So one thing is definitely it's a space saver. And that's kind of like you don't need to have a lot of consecutive square acreage in order to do container gardening, whether it's indoors or outdoors. You can fit it into nooks and crannies and corners and any place that works for you. And this is really cool because I feel like it optimizes the space that you that you do have available. Um, and so that's a great reason for container gardening is you'll be able to grow uh, in more places than than normal. You can be really creative with it. It's also can be a money saver. Um, I feel like with container gardening, you can spend as much or as little as you want to. So there's a lot of options for just repurposing or finding things for free um, and that you can keep your expenses down. So that's really cool too. Um, you can also reuse your potting soil year after year if you're uh, always complementing it with nutrients. Another benefit of container gardening is you will be doing less weeding because again, the square, 
footage is going to be smaller. Um, and also you're not using field soil or ground soil, so it doesn't have all of the little seed seeds of the weeds in it already. Um, container gardening is also really adaptable, which I think is one of its biggest strengths. You can adapt it to fit a certain height. If you have someone who doesn't want to bend over while they're gardening, you can kind of lift it up. If you have someone who's using a wheelchair, you can make it at the proper height for them. If you are gardening with three-year-old children, you can make it really low to the ground. Um, and it can also fit a lot of, this is kind of goes with the space saving too, but it's really flexible in the formation. So, you know, a lot of people put their containers on wheels so that they can wheel them around um, to catch the sun or if they, if they need to open up a yard or something like that. Um, and then anyone can do it. And again, that's like kind of the point of you don't need to live next to um, a vacant lot with black gold dirt in order to do this. You can do it on a shelf in your room or you can do it in a corner of your of your balcony, something like that. So next up, we'll go through some of the challenges and throughout the presentation, we'll be going over different strategies to overcome these challenges. One of the biggest challenges is how to ensure good drainage and that's probably the number one important thing when you're looking to set up a uh, container planting. You also want to know what are the water needs of your plant, the type of container that you have, the type of potting soil that you have, so knowing when to water um, and when your plant needs to dry out. Uh, keeping soil healthy is another thing um, that's good to know. Um, since it's not with containers, it's not part of the soil biome and like a living, breathing ecosystem that's interacting with, you know, in a natural world in the same way that ground soil is, you are going to need to know how to feed it and keep all the nutrients um, alive and well for your plant as well. So you're trying to keep the soil like alive and fertile and you're trying to keep your plant alive and fertile as well. And then staying alive for a long time, I think is a big challenge that we all run into with container plants. I know I've bought a plant from the farmer's market, something goes wrong and it dies. And then I buy another one and then it dies and then another one. And then I kind of, I've given up in the past, but there actually are some really good strategies and best practices that you can put into play um, so that you can keep certain types of plants alive year after year. And that's gonna involve the transplanting, the repotting and feeding your soil. So the first aspect I wanted to go over, <clears throat> when you're looking to start a new container plant or container gardening, you do want to know what type of material do you want to work with because they are all going to interact um, differently. So here on the left, probably the most common and the cheapest thing to use are just, you know, plastic. And a lot of times if you're digging things out of your recycle bin, um, like yogurt containers or things like that, a lot of it is going to be this kind of sturdy plastic. Um, plastic retains water well, um, and it's easy to poke holes through, again, if you're repurposing some other type of uh, recyclable. Um, metal is also another one that retains water really well. Something to keep in mind is metal heats up really fast in the, if it's in direct sun. So if it's in direct sun in your window all day, or if it's sitting on top of hot black asphalt outside, Sometimes the metal can actually heat up so much that it'll cook the roots um, and that could be a reason why your plant isn't doing well. So if you notice that the plant's getting really dried out super fast um, and it's in metal, maybe you want to move it a little out of the direct sunlight or maybe you want to paint it a white color so it doesn't heat up so much or maybe you put it on top of grass instead of concrete, something like that. This other picture here is a terracotta, unglazed terracotta pot. Those are also really common. People really like them for the aesthetic as well. They are made out of a porous material. So that means they actually dry out um, at a faster rate than the metal or the plastic. So that's good to keep in mind. And that can either be a positive thing for you or a negative thing. It depends what kind of waterer you are. Um, so if you're the type of person who really likes, you know, to check up on their plants a lot and, or if you have, you know, children who really enjoy watering, maybe you want terracotta or if you have a plant that is prone to root rot, like basil. Maybe you want terracotta because the air can actually pass through 
the pores as well in the terracotta and actually dry things out faster that way. So that's something to keep in mind. And then this last one here, I was even a little reluctant to put on, um, on the PowerPoint because <clears throat> I think these glazed ceramic pots are kind of popular, um, but they often don't have drainage holes. And so that's something you have to make sure that if you are using one of these glazed or ceramic clay pots, you have to make sure that somehow your plants have a way to have that drainage. And so in the next slide, I'll go over some tips for drainage. <clears throat> Excuse me. So um, the first thing I would always recommend, especially if you're just getting started with gardening, is to just make your life so much easier, pick a pot that already has holes. Or if you're using a plastic recyclable, those are really easy to put holes, holes into. Um, if you decide you want to make your own holes, you can definitely do that. It's a little harder with um, the terracotta pots, the glazed surfaces, <clears throat> like ceramic, and with metal. So just make sure you're using the proper drill bits and that you know how to do that and you're wearing protective eye gear if you need to. Um, if you're doing indoor container gardening, uh, you are going to need a drip tray. The, it's a good thing when the water actually drains out of the bottom because that means you've given your plant a really good soak. So you are going to need a drip tray. Um, and sometimes people who are outdoor container gardening, they actually use a little, uh, little pot feet or they'll put like a brick underneath the pot, which elevates it and allows the water to flow away even faster. And this is going back to that, um, to the ceramic pot, if you don't have holes in it already and you don't want to make your own, <clears throat> you can still garden with it. You're going to have to be a little more careful if you're doing um, pebbles or pumice or lava rocks at the bottom. Lava rocks are kind of the best because they actually absorb water. Um, so you can see that's done in this glass jar here. Or if you're using the ceramic pot, what I recommend I think is the easiest and actually the healthiest for your plant is to just use a, a plastic pot that has holes and slip it inside a ceramic pot. And that's a really easy fix. It, it kind of like solves all your problems because you get to have your cute ceramic pot that matches your aesthetic um, and your plant has a built-in drip tray as well. All right, so we've talked about types of containers. We've talked about drainage. Now we're gonna talk about what are you planting in? What is your growing medium? And you might have noticed, I didn't even use the word soil to title this slide. And that's actually because um, for potting mix and potting soil, it actually most of the time does not even contain ground soil. Um, and that's because for your growing medium inside a container, it needs to be loose enough to allow for root and water movement and the exchange of gases around the roots. So we need it to be really light and airy. Um, the reasons not to use outdoor dirt, like from your backyard or even from like a, you know, like a garden that's using ground dirt um, is that one, it could have contaminants if you haven't tested it. It could also have soil borne diseases that are inside of it and a lot of weed seeds. And then the, one of the really big reasons is that outdoor soil is just too heavy and it'll compact really quickly. Um, if you're watering the ground outdoors, the soil isn't being stopped by any type of impermeable surface. But when you're planting in a container, every time you water your plant, um, the soil will get stopped by the bottom of the pot and it'll just keep compacting more and more and more. And that's gonna, um, your, your plant roots won't be able to grow through it. Um, and also outdoor soil uh, tends to be tilled usually by insects. It'll have earthworms in there or sometimes even like the gardener or farmer is always going to have to till that that soil over time. So that's just a very different ecosystem, um, the ground soil versus what you actually need in your container. All right, in the next slide we'll go through um, if there's no soil in there, what's actually in potting mix, also called potting soil. So most of them um, have 40 percent peat moss and the peat moss uh, provides a lot of water holding capacity. So the peat moss is what makes potting soil so light and um, just like 
sometimes when you pour it out of the bag, it just like kind of poofs up. That's because of the peat moss. There's also pine bark in there, which helps the um, soil to avoid becoming too compacted. So it gives it some structure. Um, it's got vermiculite, which helps with water and nutrient retention. And then it's got sand or perlite usually, which helps with drainage. Um, something to keep in mind is that peat moss is not a renewable resource. A lot of potting mixes nowadays are starting to use coconut choir, which is um, a renewable product. It's made out of coconut hulls um, and you can buy it in these little bricks. We just order it online and it's these really lightweight bricks that are super compacted and you put them into like a five gallon bucket, add a little water and it like expands to fill the bucket. So that's actually a really great option. Um, and some people choose to make their own potting mix by buying all the separate ingredients. The easiest thing to do is just to buy a bag of it. Um, we don't have any suggestions for what brand. A lot of people ask us that, um, but you just wanna look for, for what fits your needs, usually an all purpose potting soil. Um, sometimes you, you might wanna go with an organic one or one that has coconut choir as a substitute for peat moss. So those are things to keep in mind. Um, if you have succulents, cactus, or snake plants, then they make potting soils for that as well. And actually, Kristen, can you bring us, there's one other thing in the previous slide. Um, one is that sometimes they make outrageous claims like it'll grow your plants twice as big, which I wouldn't believe. And two, you'll see under, underneath that says feeds plant for up to six months. And that's what the other bag as well says. So that is actually when you buy all purpose potting mix, um, it's gonna have the, the nutrients and the plant food in there. But around the six month mark um, is when you're gonna have to start adding in your own types of plant food or fertilizer. And I'll go over that a little later. But let's go to the next slide. How to plant. So what you wanna do once you get your potting soil is you always wanna dampen it before you put it into your planting pot. Um, because of the, the peat moss and how light and airy the potting mix is, once you add water to it, it'll shrink down to almost half the size. Um, I had a friend who planted something a few weeks ago and she, she didn't wet her potting soil first. So she filled up um, her little container with, potting, with dry potting soil, planted her seeds and then watered it and it just like sh shrunk down to only fill half the pot. So that's why you wanna moisten your potting soil first. Um, you do wanna leave about one inch from the lip of the pot because you don't want the water to overflow when you water your plant. Um, I'll go over more transplanting later, but you just plant your seed or your seedling. You're gonna pat down lightly to remove air pockets, but we don't wanna compact it too much. And then even though your potting soil is gonna be damp already, you still wanna water it just to settle everything down. Next slide. So now that you've planted something, you're gonna have either seeds or you'll have your plant in there if you, if you planted a seedling. Um, you're gonna wanna know when to water and how to water. So more house plants die from overwatering than from underwatering. So always keep that in mind. Um, if you aren't sure when to water your plant, and I do this with my plants as well, this is a picture of me doing it with my plants, but you take your finger and you stick it about an inch or two into the soil and you wanna do it towards the outside of the pot where you're not disturbing any roots. And if you can feel that the soil is still damp, then you probably wanna hold off on watering it <clears throat> and do the test again the following day to see if it's dried out more. Um, although, you know, sometimes there are plants that like to be consistently damp all the time. So it does depend on your plant. Um, you can also lift up your pot if it's on the smaller side and see if it's super heavy. That means it's probably still waterlogged and you need to give it time to dry out. Um, but if it's really light, maybe that means it's time to water. You do want to water until the water drains through the bottom of your pot. So that's why we also want the drainage holes. It gives us a good sign as to when our our plant has been fully saturated. Um, you don't just wanna drizzle a little bit on top because that'll only get the top layer of your soil watered. And you wanna make sure it's hitting even the roots at the bottom of the pot. And then it's also, if you can manage it, it's always best to water in a consistent schedule. 
that will allow your plant to flourish and grow at a consistent rate. Um, if you're kind of like starving it of water, then it's gonna go into survival mode. It's not gonna grow as consistently. And especially container planting with vegetables, um, you're gonna notice a difference in the product of your harvest. If you're watering consistently, it's gonna be nice and healthy. If you're not watering consistently, you go a week or two without, and then a week where you're doing it every day, that's gonna show up in your, in your produce. Next slide. All right, so since this is the summer garden series, I figured I'd put in some tips for watering if you go on vacation or if you need to go away for a weekend. Um, and so one way to uh, keep your plants uh, nice and hydrated while you're gone is an upturned glass bottle. So you can do this with a wine bottle or a San Pellegrino glass bottle, anything will work like that. Um, all, this actually depends on a soil moisture tension. So what happens is uh, you have to water your container completely and thoroughly first, and then you'll fill up your bottle with water, plug it on the top with your thumb, turn it over, and then really quickly remove your thumb and jam it into the side of your, your container a couple inches in. And what will happen is the water won't immediately drain out because your soil is already wet at this point when you're, when you're just starting off. But as your soil slowly starts to dry out, the water from the glass bottle um, will start to trickle out of the bottle. And that's in order to balance the soil moisture tension. Um, and one thing I would recommend with this method is test it out the week before you go away because you might find you need to put two bottles in there if you have a bigger pot. So you just wanna make sure it works out before you, uh, you, you completely leave it alone on its own. All right, next slide. Another watering alternative that we have is using an Oya. Um, these are really cool. It's a super old ancient technology that's been used um, all over the world for thousands of years. It's an unglazed terracotta pot um, or Oya, and it will slowly release water through the pores of the pot as the soil dries out. So again, this is another soil moisture tension relationship where this, the water will only leak out through the sides of the pot when the soil dries out. Um, this is a great uh, water saver because um, if you're overhead watering, especially outdoors, a lot of that water is gonna evaporate pretty quickly uh, rather than actually hydrating the plants. But the Oya, since it's all submerged underground, all of the water is gonna be going to your plant roots. Um, these ones I wouldn't recommend for like going on vacation because uh, you need to plant them at the beginning of the planting season or you need to bury them. So this isn't something you could just like stick into the side like we did with the, with the bottle. For the Oyas, you have to bury them first and then plant your things around them. So this is something to consider pre-planting. Um, and they were great in raised beds, but also in containers. Um, you can see there's all different sizes. Uh, the great thing about Oyas as well, since they're buried pretty deep within the container or the ground, they actually encourage the plant roots to grow deep and strong as well. Um, so this, this is also ensures that the water is getting to the deepest part of the roots. And you need to refill the Oyas when you use them. It depends uh, on, your, on your container and your plants, but usually every few days or once a week. So it can actually, if you're in a the type of person maybe, I know a lot of school gardens benefit from this because they don't need to have someone, a volunteer in there every single day watering. They could just do it once a week or every few days. All right, the next watering alternative I'm gonna go over is uh, a sub-irrigated planter, which ag again is using um, the soil moisture tensure, tension relationship. It's again watering from below from underneath the plant. And I have directions on our website on the follow-up resource, so you'll get this in an email. But you can build all different types of sips. Um, there's a million different designs out there. This one is a simple one that uses five gallon buckets. So you just need two five gallon buckets. You fill up this reservoir with water 
and you have a couple other things like this, the straw, you need overflow um, holes, but we have the directions for how to build this. But again, it's um, kind of in a more offhand approach to watering that you don't have to do it quite as often or every day. Um, and it's also a great like science experiment for, for kids too who are interested in that. All right. Um, I think, Kristen, can you go back one slide? I think there's one missing. There it is. So container sizing and transplanting is, um, it's a big question and it's, it is hard to say uh, a universal answer to what, what size container you're gonna need because it depends so much on your plant. One thing about transplanting I will say and container size is if you're planting produce um, that needs to be harvested like within a growing season, you don't wanna transplant that more than once, um, once a year. So nothing that you're planting should be transplanted like more than once or twice a year. Um, so if you have something like with this basil in the picture, um, basil, I know it, it needs more room for the roots. You can see how tall it is and how the root system needs some more space to grow to support the growing plant. So for the basil that in this picture, I transplanted it to the, the final size that I wanted it, the container to be. Um, if you're doing house plants um, like a pothos or a snake plant or ZZ plants or most, most of those kinds of uh, house plants, for those you only want to go up one or two sizes each year. Um, you don't want to put it in like a gigantic pot. But for, for vegetables and fruits, you want to put it into the final um, size container. Um, so it's time to transplant when you notice, one, that it might be root bound, that there's roots coming out of the bottom of it. You know you're gonna need to transplant or repot if they've stopped growing, if they're not getting larger, if their growth seems stunted, or if the soil is drying out like every day. In the next slide, you'll see um, what it means to be root bound. And this is my rosemary plant. And as I was researching for this workshop, I was like, ah, I should really um, do something about my rosemary plant and take pictures of it because it's the perfect definition of what not to allow your plant to do. <laughs> um, so you can see here, the roots have taken up a lot of space inside um, the pot and they're actually circling around into a dense tangled web at the bottom. And so that means that the plant either needs a bigger pot or that I need to prune the roots. Um, and the, one of the signs that I knew that this rosemary plant was root bound, I couldn't actually see the roots coming through the pot, but I did notice I, it was drying out every single day. Whereas in the past, it, I only needed to water it once a week. Another sign is I noticed some of the rosemary leaves were getting a little yellow. So I knew the plant wasn't happy. I put two and two together and then slipped it out of the pot and this is what I found. Um, and you wanna make sure that your plant isn't root bound because one, it's, if the roots are taking up all the potting soil, that means it can't retain water, it can't retain nutrients, and also the, the roots are actually kind of strangling the, the plant. So I had, two, um, I had two options. I could transplant to a bigger pot, um, which I didn't actually want to do because I have a small windowsill and I, I can't have my plants get too big because it would turn into like a little shop of horror scene where I'd have to just keep getting bigger and bigger and take over too much of my room. Um, but I'm gonna go over how you transplant and also how you prune the roots. So the next slide is how to transplant into a bigger pot. Um, usually this is best to do in the early spring or summer um, because that's when your plant growth uh, is the most vigorous but you can do it other times of the year. I just did mine and it, it seems fine. You do wanna make sure that your plant is well hydrated before you transplant it. You just wanna to try to reduce the stress as much as you can, because whenever you're messing around with a plant's roots, it is gonna get stressed. Sometimes they do get transplant shock. So you wanna kind of set it up for success. So water your plant beforehand. Um, depending on your plant, you're gonna to have to choose what type of, what size of pot to use. Um, if you're reusing a pot 
um, especially if you've had a plant in there that had some sort of disease, if it had spores or downy mildew or anything, it's a good idea to sterilize the pot, which you can do by um, like using a bleach solution and letting it air dry, or you could put some alcohol on a, on a paper towel and wipe it out and again, let it air dry. Again, we're, we're gonna not skip the step of dampening the potting soil, so always remember that. Um, when you're removing a, a plant from its container, this is gonna get harder the bigger your container is, so sometimes it might be a two-person job, but for smaller ones, you can just tip it over onto its side or even a little upside down. Put your hand around the soil line so that you know, it doesn't fall out, and then you're just gonna kind of kind of slowly turn it or you can squeeze it as well and just kind of try to slide it out as gently as you can. You never want to yank out by the stem. Um, when you are planting it into the new pot with the new soil, um, you, want, you don't want it to be more exposed than it was before and you don't want to bury it deeper than it was before. Um, that goes for almost all plants um, except for tomatoes. And then you're going to shake more soil around the plant, pack it lightly. You don't have to like punch it down, which I have seen people do. You just want to pack it lightly. And then again, water everything thoroughly. For the next couple of weeks, keep an extra close eye on it. Make sure it's really nice and hydrated. Um, give it some extra TLC while it adjusts to its new home. The next slide is how to prune your roots. Um, you do want to use scissors or sharp, uh, like a sharp edge, because you want to give the roots as clean a cut as you can. But you're going to, again, slide it out, same as you, as I just described, and you cut about a third of the root mass off. So that bottom third of the soil and roots, you're just going to cut that completely away. Um, then you want to untangle the roots and make sure that they're pointing downwards again to just encourage it to, to grow down rather than keep circling around itself. Uh, then you just add your fresh potting soil to the bottom of your container um, and put your plant back in there. And again, water it nice and well, give it a good soak. And then the next slide, um, this is the type of thing that will help keep your plants alive for like multiple years. And that is refreshing your potting soil. So as I mentioned at the beginning of the workshop, um, the potting mix will have food, but that's going to run out. So it's a good idea to have on hand um, some sort of fertilizer. Uh, a, that could be an all-purpose fertilizer. An organic all-purpose fertilizer works for most things. Um, sometimes there's a special one, um, like for tomatoes or for, for fruiting vegetables and stuff. Um, you can find special fertilizers for that. Uh, or like orchids, there's special ones, but for most things, an all-purpose is okay. Um, if you don't want to use fertilizer, you could use compost and just sprinkle some nice compost on the top, and that'll slowly, the nutrients from that will slowly leak down. Um, I use a fish fertilizer. I like that because uh, it's all natural, not really a lot of chemicals in there. You can make your own fertilizers, although you'd have to know exactly what nutrients are like going in and what your plant needs. Um, some people will cut up banana peels and put that in their in their containers. Um, also some people boil when they boil their hard-boiled eggs they use that water once it's cool and put that in there which can add nutrients. But um, so that's a good supplement. I won't say that'll give your plant everything it needs. Um, but just do some research see what see what your situation is especially for indoor plants, but pretty much for all container plants, you are gonna need to dilute the fertilizer a lot. I think for my fish fertilizer, it says to use one tablespoon per gallon of water. So you're gonna dilute it pretty heavily. Um, and if you don't wanna overfeed your plant either. So if you're using too much fertilizer, the plant can get oversaturated and it won't be happy. Um, you'll also notice minerals building up along the side of the pot. So that's also a sign that you're using too much fertilizer. And in terms of how often to fertilize, again, that's gonna be a, like a kind of a specific question based on your plant. So, you know, ask the, the farmer or the nursery where you bought it or look it up online. Um, certain plants just need it once a season. Um, other plants like 
uh, vegetables and fruits might need it every month during the heavy growing season. So it really depends on your plant. All right, and just to finish up here, get all your questions ready because there's just a couple pictures to end us off today. Um, these are just some, some examples of container, of container planting to get the juices flowing. So this is at our Grow NYC office. Someone brought in uh, these beautiful ginger plants in milk crates. And milk crates are an amazing container to plant in um, because you can put them on little skateboards and wheel them around. You could stack them on top of each other. They're already just a single milk crate is deep enough to grow pretty much any plant, even ginger, which is pretty deep root system. Um, and then to the right, we have a picture of one of our school gardens, which is actually uh, in a classroom. Um, and you can see that it just kind of transforms the space. And I would be happy to be a student in that, in that area because um, it really livens it up. It kind of transforms it. Plants are shown to really have a big effect on your mental health, on your cognitive function um, and morale as well. And the science is still kind of out uh, as to how much indoor plants can purify the air, but they definitely do it. And um, I think every little bit helps. All right, the next picture, these are just two very different ways of growing tomatoes. Uh, this one is in a burlap sack over a highway in Brooklyn, um, and it looks really healthy and happy. Um, a lot of times your local coffee shop will just have burlap sacks that they'll give you for free, and you can hang them anywhere with zip ties. And then we have an upside down tomato plant grower. And I have directions on our website in the follow-up resources for how to build this upside down tomato plant grower. And for that, you don't need any square or like floor space at all. Next up, we got a couple more school gardens. This is that one in the Bronx that turned their chain link fence into a beautiful green wall. And you can see it's, it's growing at all different levels for different heights. Um, and what I liked about both of these pictures, so the one on the right, um, inside each of these pots, they are growing. Um, and you can see they built a really nice trellising system. And so this will actually, if you have beans, peas, even I would say like summer squash would work on this, um, these are cucumbers, they're gonna grow up and, and turn into vines and cover this entire tent. And then they made a green tent in the middle of their play yard. And so I really liked these examples because it shows these spaces were not necessarily green spaces. Um, they didn't have any area to really plant into, but they really converted and created their own green space. Up next, I liked this one, PS 107 in Brooklyn. Um, this is like the last place you'd think someone could grow a garden. <laughs> but the depth of these storage tubs and like this whole line of them, you can actually get a really like productive yield out of this amount of uh, this amount of storage tubs. And you can see they just were sitting around a table thinking, where can we possibly fit this? What nook or cranny can we get it into? Um, and then down at the bottom is River Park Farm, which Grow My Sea helped build a number of years ago. And these are all made out of milk crates. And you can see they're all at different, different levels. Um, and they created this entire farm on top of concrete. This is also really cool, the milk crate idea or any of the containers, because if something happens and you need to disassemble it, or if the space no longer becomes available, that's like a, a really common um, circumstance in New York City is the space is there one day and then the next it's, you're not allowed to be there anymore, um, which is really sad. But what's beautiful about these container gardens and even with like these milk crates, um, if there comes a time when you need to take it away, you can actually distribute it out, move it to new places, and it can live on in a different form. So that's a really cool idea too. Lastly, as I was putting together this workshop, I was trying to find out if there are any plants that you really cannot grow in containers. And to be honest, I couldn't find any. It seems like as long as you have enough imagination um, and you wanna make it work, you can probably find a way. Sometimes there are other limiting factors like the amount of sun you have, and so that might 
dictate what types of plants you can grow. Um, but uh, basically, you can um, grow trees in containers, you can grow really sprawling plants like zucchini, squash, cucumbers. Um, so it's really up to you and, and what you can think up. So that is our, our workshop today, the presentation part. Awesome. And Laura, they have so many questions for you. Um, All right. Like 40 plus questions. <laughs> oh boy. <laughs> All right, we got 10 minutes. Let's see how many we can get to. Okay, so somebody asked, um, they were saying that they have like beautiful orchids and, and but they seem cramped, but they are healthy. Like, do you have any suggestions? Like if they're healthy, but you think they're cramped, like do, should you move them? Should you keep them where they are? I'll be honest, I'm not an orchid expert. Um, <laughs> and I feel like those are a very particular plant. They have really specific um, conditions that they need to grow in. Mm -hmm. The way I've always seen orchids as, as house plants is there's only one per pot. Um, that's just what I've seen. But if you don't, if the orchids are healthy and it doesn't seem like there's a problem, then you might be okay. But I would just keep an eye on it and try to see if it's, if they're actually getting crowded, what'll happen is the growth won't be as substantial. Like it'll be kind of stunted. It might not be, be blooming as well or like growing as tall as it should. Right. Um, so keep an eye on it, I guess. Okay. Um, what about if the roots, like you're trimming the roots, but they keep growing out faster, um, <laughs> but you don't want to keep replanting them in larger pots. Like, what do you do? Oh man, that does sound like a little shop of horror situation. <laughs> um, the only things you can do are pruning the roots. And then at the same time, you could also prune the leaves of the plant. So I'm not sure exactly what it is. So you might want to Google it first to make sure that it's not like the wrong advice, but um, you could prune both the roots. So a third off the bottom, and then I would say maybe even a third off the top. Yeah, that's a great idea because then you're tricking the plant into like generating more yeah. leaves instead yep. of generating more roots. That's smart, that's smart. Yeah, it might just take it down a few sizes, I don't know. Right, somebody else said, or just split it into two into two plants, like. Just, that could work. Yeah. There's a, there are a lot of house plants where, yeah, you can split them. Yeah, okay, somebody said, of my herbs, basil seems like the only one that will survive a move indoors in the fall. Do you, like, any advice for moving stuff indoors in the fall? To be honest, I'm actually kind of surprised the basil survived because all of my basil, especially if it's been outdoors all summer, it's <laughs> only one season, like, it's only a one season plant. It's an annual. Mm -hmm. um, so usually when I bring it inside in the fall, it would eventually just die. Um, so it depends. So there are some herbs that are annuals. So like chives, cilantro, parsley, those are not gonna stay alive forever. They're not meant to. They live one season, they produce, and then they die. Right. There are perennial herbs, like my the rosemary plant I've had for over a year. Um, lavender lasts for a few years and, and things like that. Uh, so it, it could just be the type of herb that you're trying to, to bring in. I don't know if anyone Chantelle or Kristen has more to say on that. Well, I think I think that was it. That was it. Just <laughs> type of herb, you know, where there's yeah. natural, perennial. It makes a difference. Yeah. yeah. It could be they're not getting enough sun as well. Yeah. That a lot of herbs, like they do, have pretty high sun needs. Yes, definitely. Um, somebody <laughs> else said, "I've heard that you should put water in the drip tray." and let the plant absorb the water from the bottom. Is that a good idea? I've seen, I've seen that, I've read about it. I don't do it myself. Um, that's kind of like, almost like a sub irrigated planter situation. Mm -hmm. um, I wouldn't rely on it for the main watering needs because two things could happen. Um, one is that 
the roots aren't deep enough where they'll actually draw the water up. So when we do build sub-irrigated planters, usually the water's in a reservoir and it's separated from the soil that the plant is in. Um, because the second thing I would worry about with water in the drip tray is that it will lead to root rot. Because if the water has nowhere to go and it's just always sitting there, the roots can definitely rot. Um, so part of sub-irrigated planters, they have like the water in the reservoir and then another little something called a wick that allows the water to go up, but it's not continuously sitting there. Mm -hmm. um, if you have a plant that is okay being wet most of the time, maybe you could do it for a couple of days if you're leaving. I wouldn't recommend it though. I think the only way that I would want to try it is if I put a wick in there. Yeah, yeah. And you can make a wick like pretty easily out of just like an old t-shirt or something. Mm -hmm. uh, just, you know, twist it, have some of it in with your plant and then the wick extends out and that'll do like, that's going to serve as your straw. Otherwise, I feel like you're It'll just actually rot. opening up the door to like stagnant water and pests and things that that too like, fungus snaps love exactly. water and wet soil <laughs> yeah yeah so it, would, it wouldn't be my go-to um right. unless but I, I would maybe try it if there was a wick yeah also if you something i didn't mention before is if you do want to cut down on the amount of times you have to water every week you could put pebbles um or gravel on top of your on top of your soil and that'll slow down the evaporation rates. So that can also help keep your plants hydrated for longer. Great tip. Someone said, sometimes when I place a basic pot with holes into a decorative pot without holes, the basic pot ends up getting condensation. Do I need the catch pot to be larger? So should I get a larger, bigger pot or <laughs> should I? I don't think. Using the pot. <laughs> surprised that there's condensation because like the huh that's interesting but um maybe what you could just do I don't think you need a larger pot I think maybe take your container out of your pot and like empty out the water that is pooling at the bottom and then put it back in that's actually just a good practice for anyone using that method because again you don't want the water to be like sitting um in your plant so I just empty out the, the larger pot. If you need to, you can also just get another drip tray for your ceramic pot as well. Okay. Um, someone was asking, should they put holes in a ceramic pot? Should they, should they try to, you know, get handy? Um, so, Kristen, have you done this before? I feel like you've, there's a certain drill bit you need to use and you have to be pretty careful. Yeah. Um, it's not as intuitive as you might think. I've definitely done it. You need to use like a ceramic or like a tile tool uh, drill bit. Um, if you, if, if you're very attached to this pot, I would be very careful about doing it because I've definitely cracked a few in my time. <laughs> um, if you're like, oh, I'll give it a try and I'll see if it works, like, go ahead. Um, <laughs> but yeah, just make sure that you use the right drill bit because if you don't, you're just going to apply a lot more undue pressure to the, to the pot and you increase your likelihood of breaking it. Um, you could also like, I mean, Laura showed the examples earlier of using like pumice or gravel or things in there to like the lava rocks, lava rocks, like things like that will absorb some of that drainage without like necessitating the, the hole. So worth trying on something you're not super enthused about, <laughs> you know, something you've been wanting to let go of and needed a little help to get out the door. <laughs> yeah. um, just until you're comfortable with like, even just how you apply pressure on the drill when you're trying is going to make a difference between like the pot surviving or not. Right. Yeah. So and you need to wear eyeglasses or like yeah. goggles because there's going to be dust, ceramic yes. dust. You don't want that in your eyes. Yeah. So no family heirlooms then. <laughs> no. <laughs> no, leave them out. <laughs> okay. Someone asks um, where and how should potting mix be stored? And I have a bag of three year old potting mix. Can I still use it? Um, so I store my potting mix in like a garbage bag 
but you can put it in in any t it, it, like when you open the bag you can just tape it shut if you're keeping it outdoors um i store it like under my couch in my living room because that's where i have space right now so i just made sure it's like in uh in plastic because i don't want it to leak out or anything um you can keep it in a, a storage tub or a container airtight is probably nice um i think even if you've had it for a few years it should still be okay um I don't think it would completely degrade because nothing has been there to, to take out the nutrients. Um, as far as I know, potting soil isn't like filled with living organisms or anything like that. So you should be fine. Right. Just okay. smell it. Like when you oh, smell it. That's yeah. a good idea actually. Yeah, you don't want to make sure it didn't like turn rancid or anything. Yeah. If like it smells like normal potting soil, then you should be fine. <laughs> What about if your potting mix, like, are there potting mix that you've seen that come with pests, like an added bonus? Paid <laughs> 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 for. Um, it it happens. Um, I I've had you know friends say that they're a hundred percent sure that when they opened their bag, like there were fungus gnats in it because they didn't have any fungus gnats to begin with in their apartment. It's rare. Um, but it can happen. Right. So, um, yeah. What about if you had a failed planting? So you planted something in your potting mix, it died for whatever reason. Should you reuse that same potting mix? Should you get a new one? What should you do? If, if you know exactly why your plant died, if you know it's because like, oh, it got overwatered or underwatered, mm -hmm. um, or my my cat ate it or something like if you know why it died it, and that it wasn't a disease then then you could reuse it but generally um i i would recommend just emptying out the potting soil throw that away uh sanitize the pot and then use more potting soil <clears throat> okay so now i'm going i'm going back to to uh kristen's roots your italian roots kristen should i use pasta water Leftover. <laughs> uh, is starch good for all plants or only some? Should we use this pasta water or no? I've had some relatives that swore by it for their outdoor plants. I don't know of and I've never used it on indoor plants. Um, I can't think of anyone I know that's used it on their indoor plants either. Um, but I do have some, I definitely remember some strong memories of grandparents carrying those big giant pots of water out <laughs> to the garden after. What about, Laura, what about your family? Did they ever pass the water? No, right? No. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, pa pasta like inherently is going to be less like nutrient rich than something like an egg where there's all kinds of mineral content like trapped up in the in the shell um i would have you know what we'll, we'll do a little more research for you on that one <laughs> someone in the chat seems very sure that you can only do that on outdoor plants yeah <clears throat> and she says only of uh, flowers and and shrubs that's, that's what good. they were using on on roses and peonies um oh. so yeah so i i, I think i think our, our chat friend is right <laughs> right all right um, someone else asked, uh, they have a ficus and, you know, they relocated and it lost a lot of its leaves. Like, it's not really doing that well. Should they add fertilizer? Should they put compost on it? What should they do? If it, if the plant started struggling after they relocated it, I'm guessing it's because it doesn't like the new spot as much. So you could keep it there for a couple of weeks but i i would think that's the reason why so look at the how much sun it got in the old spot and if you have another place where you could replicate those conditions you want to make sure it's not in front of like an air conditioning or heating vent um yeah it, but a little fertilizer or putting a little compost on it could help um, making sure that it's getting the right amount of water as well but look at all the conditions could also be that the pot if they repotted it maybe the pot is too big. Right. Um, Cause you know, sometimes it doesn't, it has a harder time absorbing 
if nutrients or like a lot of the water ends up getting lost when the pot is too big. So if it was like an inch or two bigger than the one that it was in, then that's probably okay. Any bigger than that, maybe it's, maybe it's just asking for a little smaller spot. <laughs> Okay, last question, and it's all about the, the Oilers, and it's like, how much is the square area that it's going to cover, how many plants, how many oh. to put in a raised bed, all these <laughs> complex <laughs> math. That is a good question, and I actually tried to figure that out for this presentation, um, but it, it really depends. Uh, if you are buying an Oya, it should say... Um, for the size that you're looking at, it'll be like, oh, this is a three gallon Oya, which means it generally can keep, um, I think it's somewhere around like a four by four foot contain, like raised bed or container uh, hydrated. So you're gonna have to just look at the sizing and read up online what they say it can cover. Uh, in addition to Oyas, maybe you do need to like start off with some overhead watering too until the plants get used to it. Um, Cool. Uh, there's so many questions. I just saw one uh, that someone asked how to start a community garden in Queens. And really quick, I just want to throw out, look up Green Thumb Community Gardens, and they can help um, hook you up to a community garden in your area or help you start one. Yeah. Somebody else was like, how are the school plants, how are the school gardens doing right uh -huh. now? And we got some pictures from, from um, a school garden, and it seems like some of them are doing really well. Um, so... Don't worry about the school gardens, Paula. They're okay. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we can't wait to get back into them. Yeah, definitely. Yeah, I think we should end it off here because there are so many questions we're not going to be able to finish. Um, but yeah, we'll take a look at, at the questions and we'll, if you, um, when you get the follow up email, it'll lead you to like a post on our website that has a uh, all the resources and like our other articles and links to more information. So hopefully those can answer your questions as well. Yeah. And you have our emails here if you want to reach out. Yes, email Laura. <laughs> <laughs> oh, goodness. Okay. Well, all right. All right. Yeah. Thank you guys. Thanks so much, everybody. We will, we will post the video later so you can review and we're going to send it out to everybody tonight also. So you'll be able to watch it again with your friends. Um, so thanks so much for tuning in. And there's still one more. It's coming up on August 19th. Not There's plenty of space if you'd like to still sign up. It's Gardening with Kids, um, led by some of our teacher friends from different parts of the city. And they're going to be talking about culturally responsive gardening with uh, using stem and steam. Um, so very cool topic, but lots of I promise there's lots of cooking and recipes and really fun stuff in there too, in addition to science. So um, hopefully we'll see you August 19th for that one. <laughs> All right, awesome. Bye guys. Right, bye bye everyone. everyone.